Welcome to a new episode of Connected Data Unchained. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Parker, who is one of our foremost experts when it comes to everything having to do with machine learning and AI. So thank you, Parker, for joining us. Please introduce yourself. Thanks for having me. Yeah, as Samid said, I'm a machine learning engineer and, and generative AI lead here at TigerGraph. Previously was an intern at the United Health Group, working on some various graph machine learning projects there, all the way from fraud detection to some call center logs and, and sort of sentiment and, and text analysis there. So definitely been able to leverage that across, you know, at, at TigerGraph as well, and uh, looking forward to sharing more about our generative AI plans and, you know, current, current offerings as well. Awesome. So this is a very exciting topic indeed. So can you tell us a little bit more about why graph makes generative AI that much better? How does it work together basically? Yeah. And so I kind of view this, this combination of graph and, and generative AI in two different frames of, of focus, one of which being graphs without a lot of text data. So a lot of our financial institution customers or our digital twin supply chain customers where you don't have text associated with like an account or you don't have text surrounding a product SKU. Maybe you have a description there, but you know, distribution centers or, or shipping networks, you don't really have large amounts of text. The other side of things is text attributed graphs where you have very, very large amounts of text, where maybe it's a Wikipedia and all the citations between the articles. Maybe it is, you know, Google, obviously built on top of a graph with web pages having content on them, right? And then running page rank, of course, on that. Or maybe it's, you know, some hybrid of this very structured data and some of this unstructured text data where you might have product descriptions and product reviews or patient notes or, you know, all those types of hybrid uh, situations where there may be vertex types that are very highly dense in text and some other vertices or edges that don't really have any text associated with them at all. And so we're kind of focusing our, our development efforts on these two kind of situations. And, you know, obviously there's going to be a middle ground in between those two that that's going to be covered in, in Tiger Graph Copilot as well. I think, you know, at that high level, we can sort of break that down into our co-pilot components where the, the digital twin structured data, very low text environments are going to be served by inquiry AI the best. The higher text density, you know, hybrid environments are going to be served more by support AI. And obviously there's going to be a compatibility between those two components as it's all part of that co-pilot ecosystem. Got it. So, so if you think about Copilot, I mean, this is interesting that you mentioned a couple of key components of TigerGraph Copilot. Let's start maybe with the, the, the easier to describe one. Let's start with the inquiry AI. What makes it unique? Why, why is that kind of a special innovation or a special capability from TigerGraph in terms of how we're presenting uh, inquiry AI? Yeah. So, you know, I think the interesting thing where we see inquiry AI, there, there's a couple different avenues. Some of it's very much in the development process and, and how it's been uh, constrained and guardrailed and things like that. I think more generally speaking, however, what we are doing in inquiry AI is something that you just cannot do in your typical vector rag retrieval augmented generation stack, right? Typically, you have an LLM, you have a set of documents or document chunks, you embed all of those document chunks into vectors of uh, embeddings, a user asks a question, you embed that question, you find the 10 most similar document chunks, you feed that to the LLM as a prompt, and the LLM goes from there. What inquiry AI allows is being able to reason and run simulations and all that type of stuff at the structured data layer. So like a digital twin, you know, what happens if there's political unrest in this country? How is my supply chain going to be affected? What happens if I have to replace this server rack? How is my bandwidth and, and latency going to be affected on my 
critical, you know, mission critical apps that might be serving transactions or what have you. All of a sudden, you have these answers to what if questions that you could never, an LLM would never be able to parse out of even the most complete documentation, right? And we all know that even if you had a complete, you know, no such thing of documents exists anywhere that is this links to this, this links to this, you know, all of this detail, you know, in a perfect, perfect world, it would be, but even then it, it does not allow for that simulation of, of actual real world, like numbers. Right. Got it, got it. Um, but I, I've heard inquiry AI being described as responsible AI, and you alluded to avoidance of hallucinations. Can you tell me a little bit more how Inquiry is unique in its ability to leverage what has already been invested in, in terms of building a solution on top of a graph technology versus what we will talk about afterwards, which is the support AI? Yeah. So what happens when you submit a query to the Inquiry AI component of Copilot is, okay, just for sake of an example, let's say that we're talking about a digital twin for a data center infrastructure. You have servers, you have containers running on those servers. You have, you know, a higher, higher level concept of a microservice running on a set of containers. And you might have some metrics, you might have, you know, web requests between those containers, like you would see in an architecture. If a user asks about the number of eggs in a store, what are we supposed to do, right? Like there's no data that we can go on, right? And so our first step to any query that's executed is let's take the graph schema, let's take the user's question, and let's make sure that we can actually answer the user's question in the first place, right? We're not some miracle machine that goes out and, you know, indexes all of your company's data. What's in the graph is in the graph and we will, you know, answer accordingly of, of what we have purview over. And so that's sort of our first layer of, you know, let's try and prevent hallucinations of, if a user gives us a nonsensical question, especially knowing about the data that we know about, let's say we can't answer it. The next layer of this is, you know, generating code. We've seen GitHub Copilot. We've seen some of these other development tools. And the key word there is their development tools. <laughs> they require or they should require somebody, you know, looking over what it generates. Right. I, and I use GitHub Copilot daily. I, I love, hey, I don't have to Google, you know, the syn exact syntax of, you know, parsing through this JSON or, you know, is this the exact right thing for reading the file or whatever. Right. But the key word is that I'm in the loop in that process. Yeah. And so I'm able to air catch things that it generates of like, that doesn't make sense. Or, Hey, I'm asking about stuff in a Python file, but it's giving me JavaScript. That doesn't work, right? And so what we've done is delivered this library of our, our built-in REST endpoints that are available out of the box, right? And a subset of those are very, very easy to parameterize and you know don't perform like write or delete operations, right? It's it's get a set of vertices with this where filter limit 10. Mm -hmm. Get a count of vertices with this where filter. Get these edges. Or in the most interesting case, it's run this user to find query, right? Mm -hmm. um, so customers that already use us can say, hey, I want to make this available, this query available to my analysts to so be able to execute with natural language. Yeah. And so we take that set of queries, we take in your question and parameterize that REST endpoint accordingly. We can also verify that you aren't like trying to prompt inject into this function where I can't say, run the GSQL command, drop all, right? We, we double check that what we're actually executing against the database is available in that library of functions. And so the, those are the main, you know, guardrails that we have in order to 
try and drastically reduce the hallucinations or at the very least say we don't know right instead of going there's 10 eggs in the store for you know the digital digital twin right yeah so i think basically what you're telling me is that any solution that is built on top of tiger graph today whether it's a fraud detection solution, supply chain solution, or any solution you could imagine, you could just simply leverage Copilot to provide a human interface to that solution, leveraging all of the investments that were made in terms of the schema, the queries, and the knowledge that is contained to be able to serve up answers in a human readable way, augmented with visualization as needed, which is awesome, really. So this transition kind of more to compare and contrast to support AI, without getting too much into the details. I know we're gonna have a separate session specifically about that one. How does it differ then in this regard? Yeah, so support AI is really focused on taking a set of text documents and structuring that as a graph. And that maybe is a graph by itself or it might be linking into an existing graph. So, you know, you could picture, you know, user support documents or support tickets or, product reviews, product descriptions, all being incorporated into a customer 360 graph of this customer has bought this product. They have this combination of error codes, you know, in this geography with these regulations of how we have to, you know, claim warranty claim this, you know, and now all of a sudden you can retrieve the exact, you know, steps as a support AI or a support agent for this, you know, service company, you can say, okay, here, here are the documents retrieved by Tiger Graph based off of both that structured knowledge and that unstructured knowledge of the documents of mm -hmm. describing the regulations and, and processes for that given set of combinations. And so at, that's at the very high level. You can also, you know, delve down deeper into this where it's not necessarily just linking the documents to real data in the, the customer 360 case, right? It's also extracting the entities and relationships within those documents. Mm, makes sense. That's, that's definitely going to elevate the capability of the support AI assistant because it's not, like you said, it's not just the content of the document, but also the knowledge that's embedded in there in terms of, like you said, the the entities and the concepts that are found. Yeah. So actually, just to make sure we cover this part of this topic as well, can you tell me a little bit more about how Tiger Graph is leveraging semantic, symbolic, and vector embeddings as part of the co-pilot solution? Yeah, so semantic and vector embed er, retrieval is, is the same, one and the same, right? They're going to be your embeddings based off of uh, text and you get those from your large language provider. There is also an entire different tangent that we can go down on, on graph embeddings, but we'll save that for a later date. But in terms of semantic and symbolic retrieval, you have sort of a, you can think of embeddings kind of as a fuzzy filter, right? Because they're at the core, they're a lossless or a lossy compression algorithm, right? You have this big, huge set of vectors that are, you know, one by however many words in your corpus, right? And you compress that down to, I think the one of the more recent open AI dimensions is like 1500 and some. Uh, floating point numbers. And so obviously there's going to be some loss there in that process. And so you don't always end up with the knowledge of specific entities or knowledge of specific ideas being contained within that document chunk or document, whichever you embed, right? And that's really where we gain the value of being able to do this hybrid retrieval process of also leveraging that symbolic knowledge that we extract from the documents and build as a graph. All of a sudden, we can take this fuzzy match of, you know, maybe it's some technical acronym or, or something like that, that the query that the user asks about, but the, and the embedding search comes up with, you know, 10 instances of where this document or where, where this term lies within this set of documents. 
but it turns out that the you know the definition of that term is actually the 11th document and that's what you see in problems with with rack today yeah. is you have this very very fixed window and you want to keep that window fixed because as you even with these very very large context windows that Gemini just came out with. There's a couple others that are like, you know, 100,000 plus tokens. That still costs something, right? So, you know, people go, just, you know, push all of your document into the model. Okay, that's now all of a sudden a, a $10 charge, right? So RAG is kind of in an interesting spot now where it was a hack previously to try and incorporate more information. And now it's a cost saving measure, which it, I guess it, it makes sense, um, but you still have this problem of, I don't want this ever expanding context window. And so how do you get a better and better recall on the set of documents that you recommend or the amount of context that you put into your LLM? And that's really where we're seeing value in, you know, being able to symbolically reason as well. And then you can all, you can get into this, you know, the ontology and taxonomy world as well, where all of a sudden all of these things are synonyms or here are the rules of when you run into a high value customer and, you know, an issue with whatever they bought, you know, how... Can I reason about this symbolically in the graph and then only say to the LLM, you know, hey, here's what you need to do, return it to the user in a pretty format, right? right. Yeah, makes sense. So I know we're going to dive deeper into various co-pilot topics later on and would we'll have you come back as well, but I want to leave the audience with one final question, which is, what gets you the most excited about when you think about our vision for Copilot? What is the thing that makes you want to jump out of bed to start working on it and, and building it out? Very good question. You know, I what excites me, and this is also actually one of the challenges of <laughs> developing right now a generative AI solution, is that there is something new every day, right? It it is a field that is moving very, very quickly. However, it is, and there, there's a lot of hype, right? Like, I think everybody is kind of waiting for the inevitable crash of some mm -hmm. sort, right? It's, it's not going to be crypto crash level, right? Like, that's good. But what excites me about Copilot is that it's leveraging generative AI, but it's kind of a solution that's agnostic to uh, any particular fad in the generative AI space, right? You know, we're we're aiming to be agnostic to different LLM providers. Basically, just bring your own own your own choice, and it's also just one of those things of at the very basic level of some of these things. Inquiry, especially, is is a UX layer, right? It's it's leveraging generative AI to broaden the appeal and broaden the maybe appeal is not the right word, but it's broadening the audience of being able to leverage Tiger Graph, right? It's all of a sudden an analyst can ask a question. All of a sudden a product manager can ask a question. Yeah. What hap what are my codependencies in this project? What happens if, you know, this supplier shuts down tomorrow? Yeah. It it's really democratizing that ability to answer a question about your business across the board. And, and, you know, I, I was using inquiry AI as an example there, but, but same thing with support AI, it's just the different format of that data, right? It's really helping surface all these very, very cool insights to the broader organization. Yeah. I think the word, the operative word there was democratizing insights and analytics for everyone to be able to use with ease. Well, Parker, thank you so much for being with us today. I know there will be, like I said, multiple sessions coming up with you talking about various aspects of Copilot. So look forward to those. And again, thanks again for being with us. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye.